You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. Come on, say it again. Give me my mountain. Give me my mountain. And so Joshua chapter 14, let me read a little bit. And I'm going to pick up at verse 6. I'm going to pick up at verse 6 because I really want to focus particularly on Caleb. Um, and this, before I start reading this, right, um, let, let me give you a quick little trivia test. Um, identify some of these folks for me. Um, Nabai. N-A-H-B-I, Nabi, um, Gaywell, identify him for me, um, Sethor, S-E-T-H-U-R, Shaphat, identify him for me, um, Egal, Gadiel, um, Amiel, we don't know these folks, do we? Do you know Joshua? Do you know Caleb? Well, those other folk were the other spies that were with them in Numbers 13 and 14 when they were sent out to spy out the promised land and they came back, only Joshua and Caleb come back saying, we can do this, we can take the land. Isn't it funny how folk who don't embrace the promise and don't get the vision aren't even remembered anyway? That don't, don't, don't get all bent. I just want to say that. I just want to insert that in somebody's life. Just don't get all bent out of shape about folk who don't get it. I just rattled off eight, nine, ten folk who didn't get it. You ain't never heard their name before. But if I say Joshua and Caleb, matter of fact, Joshua got a whole book named after him. The rest of these jokers, we don't even know who they are. And so don't get discouraged and disheartened, disappointed, or bent out of shape by folk who don't want to ride along with what God is telling you to do. And by the way, it's a good word to remember, don't follow the crowd. You can't ever get your mount because the other ones die before they even get into the promised land. And this is what holds on. This is what Joshua, I'm about to read it, Joshua holds on to and Caleb holds on to because he is told, he is given a promise by God and by Moses when he is a young man, all of these years have elapsed, but he is holding on to the promise. And now, after all of these years of still holding on to the promise, he is at the point like, hold up, wait a minute, hold up, hold up. Forty-some years ago, you told me I was going to get something. I want my mountain now. <laughs> and that's what this is about. How do we get a mountain? How do we get it? How does it happen? And so Joshua chapter 14, verse 6, and the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal. Let me just say this real quick. What, the thing I love about Caleb is that jo he and Joshua come back in the beginning in numbers. They say, we can take the land, and we, you know the story. And, and they don't. They wander for all these years. Now, Joshua is raised as the second to Moses. I want you to understand this. We don't, we don't even hear from Caleb again till now. And let me tell you why that's so valuable, because sometimes the Caleb's that we can be can be frustrated, angry, jealous over the Joshua's. How, how you get a book, how you get a title, how you get a position, and we don't see this sense of jealousy in the life of Caleb. He just falls back into the background. It's a good word for somebody. Sometimes when God shows you something, you don't have to promote yourself. You don't have to have your chest or you don't have to call your name out. You can just fall back into the background. And at the right time, and you got to get this, God promises stuff, but we don't always get it until the timing is right. And all of these years have elapsed. Now, finally, the timing is right. And the timing has come for J uh, Caleb to be able to get his mountain. Let me, let me read it. I keep saying I'm going to, so let me, let me read it. Um, then the people of Judah, this is Joshua 14, beginning at verse 6. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Kenizzite, said to him, 
You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet you're going to see this theme. Oh, I love it. Here's the theme about Caleb. Um, um, but the brothers who went up with, with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord, my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever. Because you have you're going to see the theme. Holy follow the Lord, my God. And now behold. <laughs> oh, boy. The Lord has kept me alive. Just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. Well, you, you're going to shout over just the reading of this. I am still as strong today. Oh, where my where, where my wise warriors? I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country. Translation, give me this mountain. Give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Oh, goodness. This, this is so encouraging to me, man, on so many levels. And so let me get right to it because I have a whole lot to cover. And, and, and y'all, Hebron is like, it's prime real estate. See, this is not just any old land in the promised land. This is, this is one of the uh, cities of refuge declared by Joshua. This is where Abraham and Sarah are buried. This is where Isaac and Rebekah are buried. This, this land, this is where Jacob and Leah are. This is prime real estate in the promised land. Here all of these years have elapsed. And what has kept him alive is the promise that God made to him. And I want to encourage those, I'm, I'm going to get to my introduction, but I want to encourage those of us listening to Bible study, man, you have to get a promise from God and hold on to that thing. And when you hold on to that promise, it guides your prayer life. When you hold on to that promise, it forces you to stand. When you hold on to that promise, it keeps you from wandering and wavering and giving up. Man, holding on to a promise will keep breath in your lungs. It'll keep life and strength in you. And he has held on to the promise because I refuse. You need to get this in your spirit. I refuse to die without getting my mountain. And you need to get that in your spirit, whether it is your marriage, your children, your career. I refuse to die until I get my mountain. And that's what this is about today. So here's my first question to raise with the Bible study crowd today. As we unpack this, the first thing I want to ask you by way of introduction is it's a question. It is a question. What do you still have unclaimed? This is very important because in Ephesians chapter one, we are told, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Let me park here for a moment. You missed it. When you and I get saved, Jesus is the inheritance. It's a very important concept. Now, just because I have the inheritance does not mean I have claimed every blessing. When someone dies and leaves you an inheritance, they don't just come knocking on your door and give it to you. You've got to go somewhere and claim the inheritance. 
This is our problem as believers. We have been given Christ in our salvation as our inheritance, and yet we have not gone after the spiritual blessings of peace and of joy and of faithfulness. And here we are with this great inheritance acting like we have been given nothing. And so I would argue today, as we unpack this together, that all of us that are listening to Bible study have some, some promises that have yet to be claimed. I'm not walking around miserable. I'm claiming my joy. I'm not walking around having a pity party, wondering and worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm claiming my peace. I'm claiming my strength. I'm not going to walk around as if I don't have strength. I, I have this inheritance in Christ, and now I want to claim every spiritual blessing that's attached to that. Let me say a second thing to introduce this subject matter. In Christ, I have both mountain climbing and giant conquering strength. It is a very important concept. And see, don't miss this. He says, I'm 85 years old. I've been given this promise. And I love this. this is my man, man. He's like, I got it now like I had it then. I'm just as strong now. And let me tell you why. Oh, God, this is a good word for somebody. Because just because, I want, don't miss this. Just because he had the promise, just because God kept him alive to claim the promise, does not mean he still didn't have to fight for it. And let me tell you the problem that we have. Most of us only see our strength as mountain climbing strength. But when you get on the mountain, you've got to fight some giants. So I don't just have mountain climbing strength. I've got strength enough to defeat giants in my life. Let me say something. Jot this in. It's nowhere in your notes. Put this in your margin. Tweet this out. Communicate this broadly because I think it's going to encourage somebody. I want you to grab a hold of this concept. Something you and I definitely need to do. We have to stay in fighting condition. <laughs> Come on, just, just, just say stay in fighting condition. You See, because when your day comes, even though the promise is there and you get given the mountain, there are still going to be enemies and giants on the same giants that were there 45 years ago are there now. See, let me tell you what some of us try to do. We try to outlive or outweigh our giants. You don't always get to outlive it. I'm going to talk. If I get to the end of this Bible study, I'm going to tell you why giants are in your life to even to begin with. So, so what does it teach us by way of this introduction? It teaches us that conquering requires three things. Conquering requires, first of all, word. He is holding on to the word that was given to him, the promise that was given to him. You want to conquer in your marriage, conquer in your career, conquer uh, uh, health issues. You've got to have a word attached to that enemy. You've got to have a word attached to that struggle. So conquering requires, first of all, word. Second of all, conquering requires work. It requires work because, as I said, when you get to the mountain, you got to do some work. First of all, you got to get you got to do work to get to the mountain. And then it requires warfare because when I get on the mountain because of the word and because of the work, now I got to fight. And I think a lot of times we, we don't understand this. You know, I don't care what word God gave you for your marriage. I hope I have married folk that can testify. It's going to take work and warfare. Whatever he said your child is going to be, it's going to take work and warfare. And too many of us have this lazy, overly spiritualized Christianity where we feel like as long as I got a promise and a word from the Lord, then I don't need to do anything. That is not good theology. Good theology is I can't just have a word from God. I got a warfare and I got a work attached to the to the word. I mean, Jesus don't just go around, okay, I'm just going, God said, you know, for God so loved the world that, that, you know, that, I'm, I'm, that he sends Jesus and, and he dies. Well, Jesus is not just the word. He went and did some work. And then there was warfare attached. And then here's the other thing I want you to think about, this mountain. God's choice blessing. This is, this is, this is a statement about what Hebron represents. Everybody say Hebron. I want, I want you to have your Hebron. As a matter of fact, tell people in your life, stay off my Hebron. Get your own Hebron because what God has promised for you is for you. All these other tribes, 
45 years have elapsed and now God is still saying, you know what? I promise it to you and I'm going to make sure you have it. Yeah. So what does Hebron represent? Hebron represents, first of all, a place of fellowship, a place of fruitfulness and a place of fullness. I kind of touched on this issue of fellowship and fruitfulness on Sunday when I was preaching. It is important to understand that the, 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 the unique place that God has for us is a place of fellowship. Let me tell you something. If you that holy, that saved, that I love God, it's going to promote fellowship with other people. Yeah. You know, all that, you know, I'm, I can't do people. You see how that square up with God. God dies for people. Right. God does people. I said I'm made in his image. If he does people, I do people. Now, I'm not saying they don't work your nerves. I'm not saying they don't make you want to cuss. I'm not saying, they, you know, you, you know, you feeling them all the time. All I'm saying is I can't have this walk with God hiding from you, not engaging you, not talking with you, not praying with you. It's a place. Hebron is a place of fellowship. Hebron is a place of fruitfulness. I mean, the, you know, big grapes, big stuff, you know, major fruitfulness. And it's a place of fullness. Once I get here, I'm home. I'm good. I'm where God has ordained for me to be. So let me tell you how I think Caleb arrives at finally getting this mountain. Three quick things I want to communicate. The first is Caleb had confidence. If I say confidence. I, now, this is very important. Even though he had a confidence within himself, his confidence was really driven by his confidence in the word. I mean, look, go back to Joshua 14 with me again. Very, very, very important because because. He starts telling him um, about what happens. Right. He, he reminds Joshua. I mean, not as if Joshua wasn't there. Right. But you got to remind Joshua how the folk, you know, didn't, you know, and this is a good word for, I really want to say my young people, but it's a good word for everybody in verse eight. My brothers who went up with me, those those guys, I mentioned their names and we didn't even know who they were. Um, um, uh, who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. This is very important. Yet I wholly followed the Lord, my God, which means I'm not, I'm not doing what y'all do. If y'all don't want to run with, with the Lord, I'm running with him. I'm wholly following him. Now, notice the confidence he now has. Moses swore on that day. Surely the land on which your foot has trodden. Now, that's important because he had stepped on Hebron. So you got to understand, you got to remember back. Go back to numbers with me. When they spy out the land, they're not. They spies, y'all. So they're not all hooked up together. So they spies. Everybody go to their own spots. You check that place out. You go check this place out. Clearly now, Caleb has checked out Hebron, the premier land. And when he gets on the land, because I want you to get this, because he wholly follows the Lord, God communicates through Moses and says to him, because you wholly followed me, the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever. Then he he he, he reiterates it. Because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive just as he said these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses. While Israel walked in the wilderness, behold, I am this day 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as I was. I stayed in fighting condition. I'm still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and for coming. <laughs> what, you know, let me tell you what's messed up. When you finally get the fulfillment of the promise, but you too weak to fight. See, this, I'm gonna reiterate that you got, we have to stay in fighting condition. Finally, finally things get right at home, but you, you too sick to even enjoy it. Finally, things turn. You got to stay. Fighting condition for us is 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 prayer. It's devotion. It's strengthening my spirit, man. 
And so here's what we're learning about this confidence that helps him conquer his mountain. That what we learn about it is I can't claim promises that I am unaware of. Absolutely. And I think some of us, the reason, go back to what I said to us in the introduction. The reason we have, or, or, or the, the reason we, we have unclaimed promises is because we don't know what was claimed. Yeah. Let me say something that you're going to be surprised about when I say what happens, let me tell you what happens, y'all. This is such a great word. I hope you will grab it, and I hope the Holy Ghost will let me communicate it the right way. When God gives you a word, when he gives you a promise, what happens then is, and you, you, we see this clearly with Caleb. When I get this word now, this promise, my heart starts lining up with it. My hopes line up with it. My dreams line up with it. My plans line, I'm going somewhere, my plans line up with it. And then my actions line up in, with it. And literally, now it's a God's revealed, let me tell you what the word is. It's God's revealed will for you. That's what the word is. It, when God gives you a promise, er, suddenly every part of me lines up because God has revealed his will to me. We should be adding that to our prayer list. We should be saying, God, speak a promise so clearly to me that I understand your revealed will for me. Because once I understand God's revealed will for me, it's easy for me to say no to everything that's not lined up with the promise. It's easy for me to not get on the bandwagon. The reason why some of us all over the place is because we don't spend enough time with God about what his revealed will is for me. And then I won't be jumping on every bandwagon saying yes to everything because you recognize, you know what? That's not God's revealed will to me. What God said, you know, when I came to this city 15 years ago, I, you know, I, I really didn't. I thought I thought I was coming to start a church. And then God very quickly said to me, I'm not sending you to Rocky Mount to pastor a church. Now, this is going to make sense about how we're tabernacle ministers. It's going to make perfect sense when I say this. And I didn't like this because I already didn't know anybody. God says, I didn't send you, I'm not sending you to Rocky Mount to pastor a church. I'm sending you to Rocky Mount to pastor a community. Very different things. So now that I understand that's his revealed will for me, I don't, I don't need to go bumping around into another community in Florida or Texas. Because that's not what he that's not his revealed will for me. So when those opportunities present themselves, I can easily say no to them because I already know what my life exchange is supposed to be about. So that this is the confidence that he has. Let me say a second thing about this confidence. Now, you're going to be shocked by this. I don't need more faith. I need more word. See. Because faith comes by, where are my Bible readers? Faith comes by hearing. The more word I get, the more I hear, the more faith I get. And so a lot of times we feel like I didn't conquer my mountain because I don't have faith enough to conquer my mountain. I would argue you didn't conquer your mountain, not because you don't have faith enough to conquer your mountain, but because you don't have word enough to conquer your mountain. So I don't really need more faith. We, I need more faith. I know you need more Bible. You need more B-I-B-L-E. I need more devotion. I need to understand what God is communicating. I need word for my marriage, word for my children, word for my money, word for my temper, word for my anger, word for my jealousy, word for my envy, word for my bitterness, word for my sin, word for all. When I get a word, that word motivates my faith in those issues. And so this is the confidence that Caleb has. He has a confidence in the word. He has a confidence in this claim that he's now been made aware of. Let me say another thing about his confidence. The other thing about his confidence is, now I want you to go back to where he got the promise. He got the promise. Matter of fact, let me show it to you because see, y'all going gonna to think I'm making stuff up. It's very important. Go to verse 10. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. Now, now, that, <laughs> Stephanie, let me tell you what's funny to me about that. Well, he in the wilderness, too. 
You see, it's interesting to me that he doesn't say while we walked in the wilderness. See, I told you the Bible is not just the word of God, it's the words of God. So why do we get communicated that while, the, while Israel walked in the wilderness, when we know he's a part of the crew, he has to walk in the wilderness too, even though he saw it, he spends 40 years wandering too. Let me tell you what he's teaching us. Now, understand this. Hebron is Canaan. Hebron is the promised land. God speaks to him, puts his heart and mind in the promised land while his legs are in the wilderness. So this is what he's teaching us. When my heart and mind are in Canaan, my body can endure the wilderness. See, this is how you're able to walk in the wilderness because this is why he said while Israel was in the wilderness. You're going to get this in your spirit. This is why he said while Israel is in the wilderness. He said, because you know what? I'm not in the wilderness. My legs might be in the wilderness. My body might be in the wilderness. But my head and my heart, they're in Hebron. And I can deal with all kinds of hell and disappointment and frustration because my mind and my heart are not in the same place as my body. And when you grab a hold of this reality, this is what enables us to be able to handle stuff, y'all. You know, put, put your hands on yourself and say, my mind and body are not in the wilderness. My, I mean, my mind and heart are not in the wilderness. This is, uh, why do you think, you ever gone to the hospital to visit somebody, they're about to have surgery, and then they're about to go under anesthesia, and you say, well, I just came to pray for you, and before you know it, they praying for you and encouraging you. It's because their body might be in the wilderness, but their heart and their mind is in the promised land. And this is what enables you to deal. If you got struggles in your home life, struggles with your children, let me tell you why. I'm telling you, you don't need. I need more faith to be able to not leave. I need more faith to be able to endure this thing. I need more faith to run this business. I need. No, you don't. You need more word because when you get that word, your mind and your heart winds up residing where God ultimately has you, and then you're able to endeal, endure the difficult meetings, the frustrations, the disappointments, because I can endure the wilderness when God has shown me. It, when he's shown you, man, where you gonna wind up? Hey, I can wake up. See, now you understand why he's still strong. Did you get that? You, you, you understand why he's still strong because his mind, his whole life, he'd been thinking about Hebron. His whole life. My heart has been attached. So I'm not, see, a whole bunch of folk die in the wilderness because they get comfortable in the wilderness. A whole bunch of folk die. Why do you think, you, oh God, I'm teaching this better than y'all giving me credit for why do you think everybody, the whole previous generation dies in the wilderness? The whole new generation, the only ones left from the previous group are Joshua and Caleb. And the reason is because they were not living to be able to make it in the wilderness. I'm going I'm to stay alive long enough till I see what God showed me. And you need to speak that thing over your, over your lives. I'm going to stay strong enough until I get there. I'm going to stay strong enough until I arrive. I'm going to stay strong enough. I'm going to be fighting ready because I don't know what day God going to bring it to pass. And when he brings it to pass, I'm going to get ready to climb that mountain and beat that demon so I can occupy. Somebody say occupy. So I can occupy what God has shown me. So you bet. This is why in the New Testament we are taught do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap. Come on, y'all know it, if I faint not. And so I've got confidence. I'm gonna, I want to get through the teaching today. I've got confidence. Is this making sense, y'all? Is this making sense? All right, now here's the second big thing. The second big point is that I don't just need confidence for this mountain. Secondly, I need courage. I need courage for this mountain. Um, and, and we see it right here. This, this is my guy. This, 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 I, I, I'm telling y'all, when I'm 85, I'm trying to be, I want folks nickname me Caleb. I'm serious. I want, I want to be like, y'all, I'm going to come back. You know, it's going to be another pastor here. I'm going to come back for like, what is this? this I'm 55. Eight, that's what, 30 years from now? 
I'm going to come back. It's going to be Word Tabernacle's 45th anniversary. And they're going to invite me to come back and preach for the 45th church anniversary. Y'all, now some of y'all going to be alive to receive it. And I'm going to stand up to take my text. And I'm going to say I'm as strong now as I was when I was 55 years old. I'm going to have that Caleb anointing on me. And so, and so I want you to grab this thing because notice what he says. Notice what he says. He says, this is where the courage is. This is, this is, this is deep. Verse 11. I'm still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So he's got his mind made up. I'm about to fight. I'm, I'm going to fight. Now notice what he says here. So give me this hill country. Everybody say, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke. Now understand what he's saying. He's not saying hand it over to me. He's saying, give me permission to walk on it so I can get the fighting. There's the courage. Joshua blessed him. I'm at verse 13 now. Joshua blessed him. Well, let me go back. I don't want to skip over verse 12. So give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there. Now, that was the group that were the giants that kept them out to begin with. How the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Now, notice what he says. It may be that the Lord will be with me. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this courage. And I shall drive them out. Ooh, he, he, he like these young 25 year old boys. I'm driving them out. I, I got that kind of courage. Now, let me tell you what this communicates for you and I. What it communicates for us is, first of all, there is no cheap or easy way to claim mountains. Everybody say drive them out. You, you got to get this. Stop waiting for them to leave on their own. Do you think the Anakim are going to leave just because you showed up at the 45 years? He already said their cities are fortified. You're not going to just come. Some of us are going to just think we're going to just walk up and just because I'm here now, I'm going to go ahead and claim. No, you need to get ready to have some courage and be able to fight because this is where we blow it, y'all. We don't recognize. Let me give you this sub point. We don't recognize that doors of opportunity always swing on hinges of opposition. Just because the door is there does not mean I'm just going to bust it down. It, it's op everybody say opposition. I, and, and so in order to be able to claim with courage, there's some conquering I have to participate in, which means there are some things that I must overcome. And I'm going to tell you the three things we have to overcome. The first thing we have to overcome is we have to overcome the grasshopper complex. See, he never saw himself as less than. Say to yourself, I'm not less than. I'm not less than. He, he, I don't care how those other folks, you got to see yourself as worthy of conquering. You got to see yourself as who God has ordered you to be. And so I, there has to be this ability to overcome. Let me tell you about grasshoppers. And this goes back to the story in Numbers. Because when they spy out the promised land and Canaan and he steps on Hebron and he and Joshua come back to give the report. It's the other 10 to talk about. We can't do this. And we got kind of like grasshoppers in their eyes and they're so big and they have so much giants. Let me tell you about grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are easily defeated. Before they even fight good, they given up. And not only are they easily defeated, everybody say, I won't be easily defeated. I won't, I won't be. If you whoop me, you're going to have to whoop me. But I'm not, I'm not just throwing my hands up and giving up. I remember growing up in North Philly, man, you know, you had to know how to hold your hands. That's, that's, that's hood talk for know how to fight. You had, to know how, you had to know how to hold your hands. And the key is you don't win every fight, but everybody knew they were in a fight. See, a whole bunch of us think, you know, we're not going to win at all. But I can't be easily defeated. And the other thing about grasshoppers is that they are easily distracted. And so they get so caught up in seeing the giants 
that they see themselves differently and they get distracted away from what God is telling them to do. And they're starting to focus on what their opposition was. See, we, we, we got to overcome the grasshopper complex. The second thing I've got to overcome, hope I can get through this today, is I have to overcome giants themselves. I've got to overcome giants. The, the, they still have the Anakim there. So here's a blank. This is homework for next week or this week, the rest of this week. Here's the homework. I want you to jot down, if you're taking notes, the statement is blank is there to demonstrate what God can do. I want you to fill in that blank with your giant. Cancer is there to demonstrate what God can do. Loss of income is there to demonstrate what God can do. My marital struggle is there to indicate what God, to demonstrate what God can do. Whatever giant you are facing, and I'm, I'm going to try to get, I'm, 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 I'm probably only going, I'm not going to get to my last point because I got to say some things about this giant. So I'm hanging out with giants for a minute, y'all. So let me say this thing about the giant. We must drive out the inhabitants of our inheritance. You in my stuff. You on my property. You on my land. And, it, and it's not easy. You got to drive them out. True story, y'all, real quick. About a month ago, I come out one morning. A guy is parked. He has his van and a trailer on the grass of the house, just parked on the grass. So I go over to the, ask the young man, who, who driving this vehicle? He said, my dad, I said, you go get your father? I said, I just, he can, I said it's a street right here. He can, he can park on the street, but he got to get off my property. The little boy goes in, comes back out. He said, my dad said he's not moving. Now, you on my land. Now, let me just, so, so you know, guess what I had to do? In Caleb fashion, drive them out. <laughs> and we have to understand that sometimes there are going to be inhabitants on my inheritance. Can I throw this in for free, y'all? This is why you don't, have, don't let people mistreat your children, Amen. mistreat your family, Amen. mistreat your spouse. You cannot be an inhabitant on my inheritance. I have to learn how to drive them out. Now here's, I'm gonna say something. Let me just park here for just one minute. Let, let me give you this last thing I gotta overcome and I'm gonna close by going back to giants. This is for my wise warriors and not just for wise warriors, it's for me too. I have to overcome graying. That means I have to overcome the fact to, of realizing just because I'm old does not mean God is done with me. And I want to encourage my wise warriors, celebrate your gray. Yeah. Thank God. Matter of fact, can I talk to folk that's about 35, 40, you starting to get a little gray? Thank God for your gray. Some folk didn't live long enough to get gray. And don't feel like just because I'm 60, 70, 80 years old that God is done with me. It could be that it took that long in order for you to occupy what God promised you. And make up in your mind, I am not dying and I'm not getting weaker until I can claim this. So it's the ability to overcome, right? Now let me park here for just a moment and let me say some things. Um, 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 let me say some things before I get to this last point. Why do I have giants to begin with? Let me give you some, let me give you some final things to think about. It's not on your notes, just to encourage you. Because in the spirit of Caleb, I'm 85, I've waited all of these years, but I've kept fighting condition. I now get to the mountain, Hebron that is, about 3,500 feet up. I get to Hebron and I have to drive out the inhabitants of my inheritance. And God, my, my struggle is, after all these years, couldn't you have removed the giant for me? God, you have 45 years to, 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 to deoccupy Hebron from Anakim. You had 45 years. You got, you could have just not fed them for 45 years. They at least 
When I got there, my enemy would be weak. God, you, you could have you could have caused them to be born with birth defects. So at least when I got there, it wouldn't be a fair fight. But no, they just as strong just as I'm just as strong. Why, God? Why do you let the giant live? Why do you let the giant challenge me? Why don't you fight the giant for me? I think there's some things we know about. Him. First reason you have a giant is because you need to learn how to fight. See, <laughs> so you claim you have a prayer life. I, we'll find out how good your prayer life is Jesus. based upon how you deal with the giant. See, and I wish I had somebody that could testify to this truth. When you get giants, man, you learn how to fight. That's why the more fights you've been in, the less scared you become. Because the more fights you've been in, the, more, the better you get at fighting. And I'm not even talking about putting up your hands. When you start looking back over your life and said, I had to fight. You know, it's that old, it's that old color purple line. I've been fighting my whole life. I've been, you got to understand, you know what? I ain't just start fighting. Come on, is anybody listening to Bible study that could testify? I didn't just start fighting. I've been fighting demons since I was in elementary school. I've been fighting people talk about. Let me tell you something. If you 34. 40, 50 years old, you've been fighting folk talking about you your whole life. You think I'm worried now about you talking about me? I, the giants have taught me how to fight. Yeah. And sometimes, y'all, this is why I struggle with this theology of no suffering we have. This theology of no fighting. I need giants to teach me how to fight. But I think there's another reason. I just want to throw some of these at us. Um, I think the other reason we have giants is to help us distinguish between professors and possessors. A whole bunch of y'all professing what God said, but you are not possessing what God said. And the difference between being a professor and a possessor is having the ability to fight when I get to Hebron. And I don't know about you. I'm tired of just saying what God said. I want to occupy and experience what God says I should occupy. And so God gives me giants. So I'm not just a professor, but I am a possessor. Um, let me give you one more. I'm out of time. One minute. And I need to pray for us. Um, I think the other reason why he gives me giants is so I get to know who I really am in the struggle. See, the real you don't come out until it gets, it gets rough. And let me tell you something. How many of you can testify after a fight, you didn't even realize you had that much fight in you? You didn't even realize you had that much prayer in you. You didn't even realize you had that much word in you. You didn't realize you had that much faithfulness and steadfastness and stick to itness because your real you comes out in the struggle. It doesn't get exposed when things are easy. So God gives you and gives me giants to show us who we really are. And let me say one more thing. He gives me giants to show me who he really is. Notice what Caleb says. He says, it may be <laughs> that the Lord will be with me. This is a good word. Just because I'm stronger as I've ever been doesn't mean I still don't need the Lord with me. And y'all, when we go through our struggles and our fights, it's a reminder of who God is in us and for us and that God is with us. Can you look back over your life and think through every victory that, the God, that God has walked you through, fought with you through, and now you can look back and say, you know what? The God I serve is bigger than diagnosis. He is bigger and stronger than hardship. He is bigger and stronger than poverty. He's bigger and stronger than absence and isolation and separation. It's to show us that he is bigger than our biggest giants. So all I'm trying to say today is God give us the ability to conquer our mountain, to take my mountain. Say it again with me. Give me my mountain. Thanks for listening to Orthos. Hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.